What role, just in case things are cooling off in here, what role does music have in stimulating church worship? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, they had lots of instruments, didn't they? They did. Uh, you read David's preparation for the temple and the singers and the, and the harpers and the, you name it, they had trumpets and all sorts of things. Let's remember that in, under the Jewish covenant, you came into a relationship with God. You became a child of God through natural birth. Every person born into the house of Israel was a child of God, and they came up to worship. Many of them were not saved people, okay? They weren't saved people. And so God had to artificially stimulate them with sounds and sights and smells, with different kinds of food and colors and all sorts of things to artificially stir them up. The Lord Jesus said to the woman at the well, that's how it used to be. You don't have to go to Jerusalem and all of its fanfare. You don't have to go up to Mount Gerizim here with your own little thing. Those who worship the Father now worship in spirit and in truth. Where is the sanctuary now? My heart is the sanctuary. So that this is a second dramatic shift. Now, you know, we sometimes think that they had the substance, we have the shadow. They had real priests, you know? They had real altars, real sacrifices. And we somehow feel we have the shadow. No, no, says the Lord, it's the other way around. They had the shadow, we have the reality. We don't go into a little building on earth now. We go into the true sanctuary, into the true tabernacle, into heaven itself. We have the true high priest, the Lord Jesus. We have the true sacrifice, right? So we're entering in, not into earthly houses, not into man-made things. We're entering into heaven itself. Now, when we, the priests, and the people of the Old Testament never went into the sanctuary. They stayed outside. There were no instruments in the sanctuary, right? They never went in there. They stayed outside. But we now are welcome in the sanctuary. That's where we're going. So I think there are certain things we need to be careful of. Number one, we don't want to just argue from silence. There's no mention of musical instruments in the New Testament, so therefore they're unscriptural because there's no mention of hymn books either, or gospel meetings, or Sunday school, or a lot of other things we do. So to argue for silence is a bit scary. You, <laughs> you might end up with next to nothing if you just, you know, the question is not whether it's not stated in scripture, the question is, is it forbidden in scripture? Is it something that is, that is we're told absolutely not to do it? Let me tell you a little story. There's an assembly up in Canada there's a man there who's had his whole vocal cord, all his, his voice box removed. He's a new Christian. He just loves to worship the Lord, but he can't make any sounds. So the brethren got together and they agreed to let him use a kazoo. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's all he can do, you know. Let all that has breath praise the Lord. And so he praises the Lord with his little, would you let him do that? You know, <laughs> I thought it was such a tender thing when I heard it. That the brethren would be so um, magnanimous, so gracious to let the brother do that. He, he just is brimming over with appreciation and, and he has breath. He just, that's the only way he can praise the Lord. <laughs> he can't sing like we can, you know. And I tell you, I, I think the Lord would, would be happy to see that happen. On the other hand, you know what happens? Sometimes our singing is so pathetic that we try to mask it with musical instruments. And so it wouldn't be a bad idea if when we got together for fellowship, we actually learned how to sing a little better so that when we got together and sing, it was a joyful sound instead of sounding like an auto accident or something, right? I think that would be a good idea. And I've mentioned before in certain places this assembly in Westbury, Connecticut, they were all saved in a Bible study. They were all Roman Catholics. They had never sung any hymns. And they thought, well, we want to sing, so they got some hymn books. And they noticed to their amazement that there were four sets of notes. So they thought, well, I suppose you're supposed to use all of them, see? And there was a man who had been saved. His name's Paul Forcucci. He was a music teacher in the high school. And so they said, teach us how to sing. 
and they have learned to sing all the hymns in four-part harmony. And this brother says, you see, we're not all the same. You've probably noticed that. And some of the ladies have a hard time hitting the high notes. They're altos. And the ones who have a hard time hitting the low notes, they're sopranos. And the men who have a hard time hitting the low notes, they're tenors. And the men who have a hard time hitting the high notes, they're basses. And so uh, the hymns have been written in such a way that we can all sing properly in our own sphere. We're not all mezzo-sopranos or contraltos or something, you know. <laughs> and so uh, you hear three quarters of the Christians make it three quarters of the way up the scale and then two people hit the high note. <laughs> and then it goes down, 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 and one and another jump off the train as we make our way down, and then one or two are able to hit the low notes. It's, it's, not, it's not the sort of thing, I mean, the Lord says, well, you know, it's a joyful noise, and I, I accept it, but I think it might be a good idea <coughs> in our fellowship times to get around and learn how to sing properly. And in order to do that, the For, uh, Brother Forcucci has made four audio tapes, one for sopranos, one for altos, one for tenor, one for bass. And you can get a set of four and uh, ask the people in your local assembly, do you have a higher time hitting the high notes or the low notes? And then you make up enough sets of those tapes and they get, I think, 60 worship hymns, well-known worship hymns, uh, out of uh, hymns of worship and remembrance, but many of them are the same in the believers or the little flock. You can get that and you can play it in your car and you can learn to sing your part. So when you get together, everybody sings in a way that is honoring to the Lord. When you get out to preach in the open air and everybody sings that way, you know what happens? The crowd walking by say, wow, these people are serious. These people mean business, right? See, we mean business about our business. The question is, do we mean business about the things of God? Are we serious about this? What a beautiful thing it is when all of God's people are singing. This isn't unspiritual, ladies and gentlemen. To sing praises to the Lord, to sing it in a way that's worthy of God. That's a good thing to do. So if we did that, there'd be, no, there'd be no scrambling for musical instruments. The best instruments in the world are the human voice sung in four-part harmony. There's nothing like it. There'd be, there'd be no, no pressure to do it. The, the pressure for musical instruments is to try and mask the painful sounds that are coming from the Lord's people when they pretend to sing. <laughs>